you want to open your Bibles there. I did a quick uh, survey of the headlines one day this week, and I found a lot of talk about protests, shooting, violence, historic wildfires, countries fighting other countries, pandemic case surges in the Midwest, potential contention surrounding the election, and I saw an article that was put up by the New York Times, I think, last weekend that said that Trump and Biden are fighting for America's soul. And so we have this kind of rhetoric going on, this, 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 this talk, and it's causing a little bit of angst. It's causing families to, to fight with each other. It's causing division all over the place because if that is the case then if my candidate loses, then all hope is lost, right? That's kind of what's being taught right now. So politics aren't helping us find peace, are they? Uh, I'm so glad that I'm a part of a kingdom where Jesus Christ is king, undisputed. Uh, Our headlines are full of all kinds of discord. I mean, just violence, fighting, uh, concerns, anxieties, fears over all kinds of things. (laughs) Is it any wonder that our children at younger ages are dealing with significant anxiety. I mean, and that's just worldwide, national-type stuff. We're not even talking about the things that are going on in our own lives. Personal things, financial struggles, marriage problems, fair friendships that are falling apart, diseases that are attacking people's bodies seemingly at random, struggles with suffering, and how do I reconcile suffering and a, a good God? conflicts. In light of all of these things, and so many, many more than I could even name, is peace really possible? Is peace possible in me? Is peace possible in you? Is peace possible around us? Now, obviously, if you live through a biblical frame of mind, you know that, yes, peace is possible. In fact, peace is talked about repeatedly in the New Testament as a promise to us, as a gift to us in Jesus Christ, who is our Prince of Peace. Today we're going to look at one verse, Colossians 3.15. So hey, maybe a shorter sermon for you. But uh, Colossians 3.15, it's so important we just highlight this, because this is key for us. So uh, Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Paul's talking about some practical application here as he has been unpacking for us how we are to put our minds on Christ. Like we are to put our minds on him and we are to clothe ourselves with him and live for him in all things. And today the word is peace. That's what we are supposed to be known for. That's what the church is supposed to be about. Peace, as the Bible says, is peace that passes all human understanding. It's a supernatural kind of peace. So are you at peace is the question. I'm not talking about ignoring the world and like sticking your head in the sand and singing kumbaya while everything burns around you. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay, But this is an inner peace that Christ brings to us, gives to us in himself that is explained only by him and has really nothing to do with the world around us in that sense. Like, things can be falling apart, but I have inner peace because I have Christ. That's what we're talking about today. So what does this tell us about this peace? Well, first of all, there's a source of the peace, and the source is Christ and Christ alone. The command here is, let the peace of Christ rule. The gospel is called the gospel of peace. It's because he brings us this reconciliation to God. That, uh, that call of salvation, that attitude of rest and security that the believers in Christ have because he has gained for us salvation on the cross. There's a reconciliation to God, a peace I now have with God. And it's his, his peace we're called to. It's this vertical peace that starts with you know, this relationship with God. And he says we are called to this peace as a real possibility for us 
as a peace that comes when we're forgiven, when we're brought into a relationship with God. See, if we walk around in our life thinking that we are never going to approach God, that we never are going to do enough good things or never going to be good enough for God, then we sort of depress our own soul, if you will, and, and maybe even lead ourselves to more sin. Because there's no peace there. It's just chaos. It's turmoil. It's, it's unsettled. But peace with God comes through faith alone in Christ. That's what makes the Christian faith so unique. Can you imagine if, if, if in your worldview, you need to do all kinds of good things in order to make God happy? Where is the peace in that? Because how often do you mess that up? I should say, how often do I mess that up? I mean, it happens every day, right? I, I do something all, all, all the time that is, is not right. I was talking with one of our international workers some years ago, and this person was from a country we call creative access country, one of our countries where uh, it's, it's kind of a little more uh, dangerous for them to be there. And he was telling me that when a loved one, someone dies in that country, the, the loved ones of that person spend the next 30 days fervently praying for that soul, the soul of that loved one in order to, to uh, get them eternal life. And so they, they work hard, they pray hard, they, they, they hope that they prayed enough to get their loved one eternal life. Can you imagine the weight of that? And there's no peace in that. There's no peace when that's the way you have to sort of earn this. But look what the Bible tells us. This is what's so great. Is in 2 Corinthians 5.17, here's how wonderful the, this good news is. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So a lot of words there. What is he saying? He's saying that you can be reconciled to God. You can have peace with God. And that in Christ, the old has passed away and the new has come. There's a change. And then he says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you remember what it was like for you when you realized that that chasm between you and God was too big for you to sort of get over on your own? that you could not earn it, you could not do enough good things, you couldn't get a running start and sort of leap over and get there. You can't do it. You remember what that was like? When you realized that Jesus Christ has bridged that gap and your job is to embrace him and the peace that comes into your heart knowing that I no longer have to, to sort of <coughs> earn this, but I receive it as a gift. <clears throat> That's what he did. That's the good news. That's what the gospel teaches us. That's what Jesus did for us. That's what he continues to give to us. That's the, the God who loves you so much that he was willing to provide a way out of turmoil, <clears throat> the turmoil that sin creates in your life by his grace. You're able to sleep free from the guilt of that sin in your past, knowing that you are forgiven, you are set free, that it's been taken care of. It's a call to peace. Peace that God provides in Christ. And so he says, allow this peace to rule. This peace is offered, but you need to, it says, let, uh, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule. You need to allow it to rule. So there's the contrast. The chaos that's out there is this spiritual battle we find ourselves in every day because the devil is a deceiver and he's out creating chaos, trying to take away our peace, you go back to Genesis chapter 3, and what do you find? You find the serpent, <clears throat> ready to cause chaos. Chapter 3, verse 1 of Genesis, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? <clears throat> so here's what the devil is up to. Peace, there's peace in the garden. Things are going fine. He comes in. Did God really say that? 
creates all this doubt, creates chaos, and we've been dealing with the effects of that ever since. It's the lack of peace we see in our world, in our lives, all around us, is because of this, this sin. And this struggle is real, and Paul reminds us, he says, hey, you know what happens nowadays? Is, is we still deal with the, the spiritual battle, right? It's still going on. It's going on all the time. But what happens now is, is we, we sort of turn on each other. And so Paul reminds us that, hey, you know what? Your battle is not against each other. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers and spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly places. In other words, the battle is not flesh and blood. It is spiritual. And the battles that we're seeing, the chaos we're seeing, all this stuff going on in our world today, yeah, it looks like people are fighting with each other, but you know what? Behind the scenes, it's the spiritual battle. It's evil at work. And we need to make sure we keep our mind in the right, thing, on the right, in the right place here and not forget that. Because we know as believers in Christ, we understand this, that the battle has already been won. And that the devil is on this borrowed time, I guess we could call it. He still tries to destroy lives. He still tries to derail churches. He tries to take away our peace. He tries to get us focused on all kinds of other side issues, hurting each other, and creating chaos. It's an example of this in John chapter 8. I won't read the whole story, but it's a familiar story to most of you. It's a woman who was literally caught in the act of adultery. And she was, she was pulled, pulled essentially out of this, this home or wherever and brought out to the street. And there the religious, try that again. religious leaders were trying to, uh, you know, going to uh, execute her, essentially. Try her, condemn her to death because of her sin. And so, uh, you know, what do you think she was feeling? Do you think she was feeling any peace at that moment? Do you think she was feeling like, oh yeah, I didn't do anything wrong? No, she knew. There was, she did something wrong. She knew she did something wrong. And she was being tried and she was being convicted and she was being condemned. Not a lot of peace in that moment. And the religious leaders, the ones who should offer a, for, a way forward, who should have given her like, here's a way that you can maybe change your life, and find hope in the future and something different. They didn't do that either. Instead, they picked up stones to stone her to death. And so Jesus says to them, Hey, any one of you <clears throat> without sin, go ahead and start throwing the stones. <clears throat> and so what happens? They all drop their stones and they leave. So now Jesus is there with this woman, and he offers her peace in this moment of turmoil. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go from now on and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. And so here's the message, right? The only way that your peace will be found in your life is if you leave your life of sin. Jesus didn't just say, don't worry about it, it's no big deal. No, he said, I don't condemn you. Leave your life of sin. It's the only way you're going to find peace. Let peace rule. Paul writes, let it literally be the umpire of your life, your relationships, for the way you choose to live your life. You ever notice how umpires or referees can kind of get in the middle of all these guys like fighting with each other and throw a couple of flags and all of a sudden they, they stop? There's authority there. It's the same concept. If peace is our umpire. It's our, it's the, it has authority on our life to, to direct how we, we minister to people, direct how we live our lives so we're not... Um, so we're giving it away, essentially, to people and not condemning them because they're sinful, but we're t preaching the truth and calling people to a new way of life, embracing Christ. Don't forget your own story, is what <laughs> Jesus reminds them. You know, you guys, yeah, maybe uh, she was, you know, in the middle of sin, but we've all been there. And don't forget the grace you've been given. Don't forget the forgiveness you've been given. Don't forget that people that don't know Christ don't know any different, right? And so they're not, they're not going to automatically just do the right thing. And so we find a way to give people the peace of, of God given to us through Christ. And here's what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you were who once were far off have been brought near. 
See, don't, don't forget your story. You were brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. The barriers come down because we have one who has brought us together, the peace in Christ. Now, it does not mean that we ignore sin. It does not mean that we don't have consequences for our sin, because we do. It, it means that we believe in Jesus Christ, we confess our sins, we repent, we call on his name, and he gives to us peace. Secondly, the arena, the, the place where peace is sort of played out is in our hearts. You have peace with God through Christ. We've already said that, but I said it again, because it's very important. The heart is where this sort of plays out and is known and experienced. Are you experiencing peace with God in your own heart? Perhaps nobody understood the importance of this in a more significant way than uh, King David. Remember King David, Old Testament? Another story you can read sometime. I won't give you all the, I won't read it now, but King David's not where he should be, right? Sees a woman, lusts after her, invites her over. She gets pregnant. He panics, calls for her husband to come back from war, tries to sort of pass this off as maybe he you know, got his wife pregnant, didn't work that way, so he has the husband killed to cover up his own sin. And then he marries her as the hero. Well, she's a widow, she's pregnant, and I'm going to take care of her. He's in the clear, or was he? Uh, was there peace there? I mean, he had all these things he had done to cover this whole thing up. I mean, he had done all kinds of things. Was there peace? Well, for a while, maybe it would seem that way, but uh, eventually it gets uncovered. He gets confronted. In one of the most recognized psalms we have is Psalm 51, where we hear David's prayer of repentance as he kind of comes to grip with this this, this time frame, this, this years of, of, of sin that he had been sort of un, uh, covering up and holding on to. And here's one verse. You can read the entire thing on your own sometimes. Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You can hear the desire he has. There's no peace in there anymore. There's no peace, but I want peace. So I come clean. Create in me a clean heart. Sin is not tolerated in us. It should make us grieve. And the wonderful thing about it is God is gracious. He doesn't just leave us in that place of sin. He didn't just leave us there to sort of figure it out. He came to us, and Jesus says, Come, follow me, turn from your wicked ways, and follow me. And that's the call for any one of us. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And this plays out in how we relate to others as well. Not just in how we relate to God, but how we relate to other people. We have this peace with each other through the unity we enjoy through Christ. We're called individually and we're called as one. The peace of Christ is something we receive, experience, and appropriate in our lives. And therefore should be a characteristic of the community we enjoy here in the life of the church. Uh, you can't read this, but that's okay. And if you have really good eyes, you can read it, but it's, it's pretty small. But here, this is a Calvin and Hobbes. I just thought this was great for, for this. You, um, here's what it says. On the front part of there, it says, did, did you ask your mom if you could jump off the roof? Yeah, right. <laughs> Questions I know the answers to, I don't need to ask, right? Is this blanket big enough? The next screen there, you see, um, see them pulling on the blanket. Perfect, he says. See, I'll just grab all the corners and I'll make a parachute. You can watch as I float to the ground gently as a leaf. The next one you see him, Geronimo, jumping out the window and then crunch. And then the comment at the end, his mom's going to have a fit about those rose bushes. And I love that because it showcases for us uh, a classic human element we're all guilty of. And that is acting on impulse. And just without any regard for anyone else or regard for our own well-being. Doing things my own way, my own time, no matter what. I mean, how many times have you been like Calvin and deciding, I'm just going to do what I want and I'm not going to ask permission, I'm just going to do what I want and, 
and it's going to be fine, and you hurt yourself or you hurt others. It brings conflict, not peace. But living in Christ, see, changes our perspective. That it's not only about me any longer, but it's about this joint mission we enjoy together, this joint life, the body of Christ, that we can be together and we can use our giftings and we can, and you can enjoy the fellowship and, and the quirky, uh, you know, different things we all have. You know, we can enjoy that together in some uh, special way. Because people are dying every day without Jesus and our mission still remains the same. The issues of the day can divide people, even in churches, and we're seeing that all over the place today with all that's going on with the pandemic and, and just all kinds of stuff that's causing all kinds of just biting at each other. But it takes away the peace that is offered to us, that's given to us in, in Christ, and the devil starts to have his way. We can't allow that to happen. It's not who we are. Finally, Paul tacks on one more phrase here. The means for continued peace is thankfulness to God. Uh, he adds at the end of this, verse 15, end of verse 15, <clears throat> and be thankful. It might seem like, oh, it's kind of an afterthought, like, oh yeah, by the way, don't forget to be thankful. I mean, say thank you, uh, don't forget to do that. No, he's actually woven this into the entire book. It's clear that thankfulness is a key element of a follower of Jesus Christ. This is something we should be known for. We should be thankful because we've been given so much. And in this case, the peace of Christ continues to get expressed in this context of a thankful heart. Thankfulness makes for a peaceful heart. If we're thankful, we, we have a peaceful heart. There's little to do with circumstances there. I can be thankful and everything around me can be a mess. We can find things to be thankful for. That's a heart condition, something that Christ gives to us. Rather than chasing what you don't have, we thank God for what we do have. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in one of his books, said, we pray for the big things and forget to give thanks for the ordinary, small, yet really not small, gifts. It's like things he's referring to. You know, we need a little perspective on some of that. Like being able to worship here today. There are Christians all around the world who aren't allowed to worship, not because of the, you know, the governor's mandate, but because like, they could be killed they could be, the church is burned down. They, they, they have threats of violence on their life. And so they have to go underground. There are Christians that are um, experiencing persecution and are, are in prison for their faith today. So we have quite a bit to be thankful for. We've had some inconveniences this year, but we're not being hassled by and large. right? We're not being hassled. We might think we are. We're not. We're not being hassled at all. We can do pretty much what we want to do and uh, not be hassled for it. But the opposite of thankfulness is grumbling. And grumbling brings agitation inside of us. It does not bring peace. I mean, try to go a day without complaining sometime and see how that uh, works for you. See what, how it changes your countenance. Instead, when you want to, want to gripe, just say thank you for something else. Even snow in October, you can be thankful for. My daughter, it's hard to see this, but she, you know, on the picture here, she decided she's going to build a snowman. And so she did. She built a snowman and snow children and a snow dog. Isn't that great? Yeah. And, she, and you know, just, just, just peace with what's going on. Hey, we're just going to make, we're just going to have fun with this. You can watch how your heart experiences peace when you're thankful. Now, there hasn't been a whole lot peaceful about 2020. And I get that. I saw an ornament on one of, I don't know, online somewhere, an ornament for 2020. It was a, it was a, a dumpster on fire, <laughs> and that was, your, that was your ornament for 2020. The year's not over yet. I get that. But are you at peace? You can be. This is a, a heart condition that baffles the world watching, really, because it's like, why are you guys not panicking? Why are you not scared? Why aren't you anxious about all these things? It's because of the peace of Christ. It's because there's a supernatural origin to this. It's granted to me in Christ. It's the greatest gift ever given, the peace that I've been given in Christ, that I can know him and you can know him. So the offer is here to have peace. If you don't have peace today, the offer is here for you to have peace, 
through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, to say, Lord, I, b- I believe. Like, I, I'm, I'm in turmoil. My sin has messed me up. And I can't do it anymore. But you can trust in Jesus. And he can give you peace. He'll exchange that for you. He'll take, he'll take your sin and he'll give you his peace. It's a good exchange. And it's free. You just ask him. To admit you're a sinner, to turn to him and say, Jesus, I believe and I want to know you. And if that's you, I invite you to do that today. To trust him. For those of you that do know him, and, and uh, the, the, the challenge for us is to represent him well to the world. To offer peace. To live this peace that we have with each other and with the world around us. To express this peace to them. To, to show them the, the peace that we have in our lives that comes from Christ. That we can represent him well so that the world knows that, hey, you know what? There's something better. There's something with you know, foundation that I can put my life in and not on this rocky soil, this, this sandy soil that we're, we're on right now that's constantly changing and moving and falling apart. The world needs his peace. And you, your life is an opportunity to give that away, and we as a church have that opportunity as well. So are you at peace? Will you live that? Let's pray. God, we do realize that there is a, a lot going on, and there are plenty of people around us who are <clears throat> looking for peace. And maybe there's some in this room or watching online this morning who are, are realizing that, you know what, there's something missing. And so the invitation's there. You, you told us that if we confess with our mouth, if we believe, that we will be saved. And so I, I pray right now for any who perhaps has never trusted in you, have never trusted in you, and are desiring to know you today, Lord, that we call upon you and say, Jesus, I, I believe. I want to receive you as my Savior, as my Lord, as the one in whom I, I place my, my trust, my life. Forgive my sins and set me on a new path. That new creation, as we have read earlier in, the, in 2 Corinthians, the old has gone, the new has come peace with God, to have assurance that I will be with you. And Lord, I pray for the rest of us as well as as we live today in this world and try to navigate a difficult political season and try to understand the, the things going on around us and the pandemic issues and just the stuff in our own lives. There's a lot to, to perhaps derail us and get us worried and get us stressed out, but Lord, may we take your peace and may we give that peace away. Fill us with yourself. Thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song here to conclude our service. A great, a, a great song, a testimony for this, uh, as included for this, uh, this message. <clears throat>